Good evening um, to our listeners and our viewers, and welcome to this program. Um, we are hosting, uh, I always wonder what, is it Comrade? When the CDE, is that meant for Comrade? Yes, yes, Comrade. Comrade Mind matter. And uh, we are discussing a radical approach to leadership. So welcome. If you are, I'm wondering, because people will listen from different places, so I'm, I'm sure it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to anyone that's watching us. Um, send in your stars as well. Um, I always forget to say that part. Uh, we only exist because of the support that we get from you, our viewers. Um, Mr. Mainda is um, ward councillor for Kamwala. Um, and I, I somehow call him a radical leader. <laughs> I always say he's a bit radical in his approach because um, I find him quite interesting. Um, I think in a couple of months ago, you had actually picked up some rubbish and dumped it at the council premise because uh, they were not collecting the rubbish in your or the refuse in your ward. And probably that's why I say you're a radical person. And that's the angle we're going to discuss about if a uh, radical approach to leadership is probably what we need today, maybe in Zambia. So welcome to the program, um, Comrade Mayin Dasimata. Thank you very much, uh, Mwerwa. Thank you for hosting me on TV Wakwe 2. And um, good evening or good morning, depending on where you're watching from, to all our esteemed viewers. Cool. So I'll go straight in. What attracted you to politics? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. First of all, I've always believed that uh, politicians who are there to serve are driven by a passion for the people. 
They are driven by a passion to see change in their society. They are driven by a passion to see things change. And basically for me, joining politics was a way of availing my ideas uh, to serve my country. Because I noticed to say that there are a lot of things that were wrong in our country. There are a lot of social and economic injustices. You can talk about poverty, you can talk about uh, low standards of education, uh, problems in healthcare, problems in job creation, manufacturing. It's a whole wide a, a span of social and economic issues. So what really drew me to politics was I said, look, I think I have what it, what it takes to contribute some ideas on how we can make things better. And uh, I'm happy that uh, our current president, President Haka Indechilema, has fulfilled one of those uh, dreams that I had way back, where I dreamed that we should have a system of free education so that even those people that come from underprivileged families can also have access to education and by so doing also contribute to the growth of our economy, to the growth and improvement of our society. So basically, the drive is to improve human life. The drive is to improve the standard of living. The, the drive is to leave this country better than we found it. Okay. Um, and it's no secret that you were initially in the Socialist Party. Yes. Um, in your early days, yes. Um, I'm interested to know what made you make the move. Because I mean, these ideologies, the Socialist ideology and the UPND ideology are quite different. What made you change thank you first i'd like to put it across to say that um ideologies there are no hard lines that divide uh, ideologies you find that some of the ideas in various political parties in terms of ide ideology are always cross-cutting i'll give you an example of the current policy of free education the current P policy of uh, free education is a socialist policy but it's being practiced by the UPND, which uh, is a social democratic uh, party. I think the lines in the differences in terms of ideologies are very, uh, they are fine, they are dynamic, and they change according to the implementation of the government that is there. But basically, the idea, the idea behind every ideology is to improve human lives, is to improve the economy and improve the welfare of people in society. We differ on how we can best improve those things. And because we differ on how we can improve those things, that's why we have different uh, political parties. Different political parties definitely have different ideas on how we can, uh, we can, uh, we can improve uh, the economy. So yes, I have been a part of the Socialist Party. I was part of the Socialist Party. And I was even part of the UPP, the United Progressive uh, Party of uh, Soviet Shimba. So I've gone through uh, one or two political parties. And I think that is very normal because if you look in history, uh, people uh, cross, uh, cross political divides depending on the mood or depending on the current circumstances of a particular country. And you saw that we were in a revolutionary time in our country. I think what mattered to a lot of Zambians was not whether this party was socialist or this party was uh, uh, social democratic or whether this party was even capitalist. What really mattered to a, a lot of people, the Zambians at large, was they wanted change and they wanted change because they wanted to see an improvement in their lives. They wanted to get rid of runaway Qatarism, violence, thuggery and corruption. And for them, it was about changing government and putting in place a set of leaders that listen to people, a set of leaders that are going to take them from where they are to where they hope to be. So yes, I'm now in the United Party for National Development, which is a social democratic party. Uh, to sum it up, for those that are not very familiar with ideologies, we believe that we must allow free enterprise to uh, take root, as well as ensure to say that as free enterprise takes root, people are able to do their businesses, we should be able to effectively tax these businesses and then plow back those benefits into social programs like the ones we are seeing on free education, on um, uh, social security welfare packs such as uh, uh, food programs, such as uh, social cash transfer, the, the, the displacement of monies to people that are underprivileged, those that are terminally ill, those that are disabled. It's basically a program that hopes to improve the economy on one end through allowing private enterprise as well as plow back the benefits of an improved and buoyant economy by taxing it effectively and then redistributing those uh, profits to social programs such as we are seeing today. Okay, so does, this is one thing that probably um, 
personally, I, I've, I've, on a personal note, I found it very um, retrogressive for the nation, I think, because we've had the same politicians. I mean, the same politicians in UNIP, the same politicians in MMD, the same politicians in um, PF, and now we even have some of them still in the UP Hendy. So I'm now thinking, what is different about this generation? If you equally have moved from the, is it the UPP into the socialist, into the UPND, uh, what is different about this? Because it feels like it cements us more in the old trajectory because it's like people just carry on what they were doing because they were already in, in, in politics. Thank you, Mora. You are very right in uh, mentioning to say that we have quite a number of politicians that have uh, come through the different political parties, the major political parties this country has seen. But uh, you must understand that to begin with, uh, moving from a political party, from one political party to another, is one democratic right. And I think people or political players, most political players at least, uh, I would like to think that they move based on an assessment of where they are. Sometimes it so happens in politics that you join a political party today. That political party stands for, uh, for justice. It stands for what is right. It stands for development. It stands for the anti-corruption and the uh, I mean improvement in the welfare of people. But somewhere along the line, I'll give the PF an example. Okay, it was a it was a good startup under uh, the late uh, Michael Chifesa Tame is uh, so rest in peace. He wanted what was good for the country, but unfortunately, he passed away. And look at the people that took over the PF. They totally went a different direction. And you had some of those people who were in the PF leaving the PF to join the UPND because they felt they couldn't uh, they couldn't be part of a political party that has diverted away from the ideals which they stood for. The same thing was uh, happened when UNIP first um, liberated us from colonialism in 1954. <laughs> Yes, uh, the, the comrades and freedom fighters that were, that stood for principle. But as UNIP ruled on for the record 27 years, some people felt, well, well, I think we cannot uh, stand for a party that does not want to allow a multi-party democracy because they felt it was uh, it, it, it was an affront to the ideals that they stood for when the country got independent because they wanted a country where people were able to choose their leaders freely and we didn't have a Wamiyaya president. So okay. the dynamic in terms of political players shifting from one political players, we have seen it before, we are seeing it now, and I think we will continue to see it in the future uh, because ultimately what individuals in political parties stand for may change once the policies of the political party begin to change in a direction of which uh, they do not approve for they, they do not approve of but ultimately Mwewa, ultimately i think uh, uh, this also has to do with us the youth because we are the ones that are going to be here uh, 20 30 years from now and if we do not participate in politics if we do not participate in politics, then we are going to have a very big problem. And that problem is that we won't have uh, youths uh, being in political places. And you have the same so-called recycled people taking over and drilling uh, until they die. Yeah. Okay. So I'll, I'll look now towards your successes. I mean, you have been um, a councillor for the last, I'll roughly say, seven, six months, and you have some major successes. I think one of them is how you uh, worked with steers, not steers, cheers. Uh, supermarket um, and you help them change their employment policies on times. I think those time oh, elements yeah. and there was equally um, shift schedules. So what what brought on that 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 incident? First of all, the issue is about justice. Uh, the, uh, in politics, like I've said, when you join politics, you must know what you are there for. And basically, we are there to help people. And it's unfortunate that um, uh, the current existing uh, labor laws in this country, many of them are good, but they are not adhered to. So when a political party comes into power, there has to be an issue of uh, enforcement. And what has been lacking really in the labor in the labor field or in the circles of labor and workers' rights is a lack of enforcement. So I had uh, some people who stay in my ward who work for Cheers, and they made a complaint to me as their area council and said, look, we are working excessive and abnormal hours. We, we, we basically work every day throughout the, uh, the week and we only have one day of rest. And on top of that, uh, the, the, the overtime that we clock is never paid. There was a span of issues. So what I decided to do was 
as a councillor, I intervened in the matter and I did uh, approach the Commission of Labour at the Ministry of Labour and I told them, say, look, there's this particular issue in my ward where the workers for this particular company have complained about the conditions of, 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 of service. And I went further to engage uh, the company management on those issues. And uh, I'm pleased to report that uh, we reached uh, an amicable solution. What they simply did is that um, they did not change their policy per se, but they simply I, I adhered to the current uh, uh, labor regulations in terms of uh, working hours and knocking off times. The worst part was that these people were knocking off at very, very awkward hours. Yeah. They would report at, uh, at 8 and then knock off at 22 hours. Now, the issue was that they were not even provided with transport to go to their homes. So it posed a security risk. One, Some of them were being robbed and attacked, and one of the ladies was almost raped. And really, that is what really agitated me because I said, look, if we are going to have people uh, literally risking their lives simply to keep a job, then I think in this country we have not yet reached a place where uh, politicians, as the guardians of the custodians of peace and security for the people, are doing their job. So I intervened in that matter. The Labour Commissioner also uh, took uh, this company to task, and the company really uh, did not give us much trouble. They simply complied. And as we are speaking to you today, uh, it's about uh, 21 hours Zambian time. Uh, the Quakers have already knocked off, uh, I think, 30 minutes ago, being a Saturday. And uh, they have time to catch buses and get to their homes safely. But all in all, I think uh, the problem of, of labor is very, very big. Um, and I think uh, we have to look at the minimum wage, revising the Minimum uh, Wage Act, because since mm -hmm. 2011, the Minimum Wage Act has never been revised. The cost of living has gone up. It's hard to, mm -hmm. to, I mean, to survive on a minimum wage of about between 1,000 and 1,200, when the cost of living, a food basket for a family of five, we are told, is about 8,000. I think there is need for the revision. But of course, that is outside my, uh, uh, the, the, my area of responsibility. That responsibility falls with the Ministry of Labour, that engaging stakeholders in industry, in manufacturing, and the unions, so that they can sit together and decide uh, how much or if at all they are going to raise the minimum wage. Otherwise, employers will continue to show us the paper and say, look, according to your current laws, the minimum wage stands at 1,200, and we can't pay anything over what the law says. So ultimately, yeah. it comes back to our politicians yeah. look at this matter of uh, wage... Um, wage increments or the revision of the minimum wage so that our people, most of them being youths who are working in these uh, uh, companies, so that they can have something to take home and as well as save up something for the future. Okay. Um, the next one I think that um, I was quite aware of was when you took your refuse bag to <laughs> to the is it the, the town the city council. The city council, yes. Um, what brought that on and has that been worked on? I live not far from Kamwala South, so I was I'm privy to how much uh, refuse we have. Some of it is literally dumped along the rail line, and it's 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 actually not a nice sight or a nice smell as well. But I looked at your approach and I laughed because it was quite radical. And I always, I've always wondered, was it a success? Has something been done about that the refuse collection in Kamwala South? Yes, yes, uh, something has been done about the refuse collection. But before I go into the nitty gritties of it, I want to say that um, uh, waste management, Zambia in general and Lusaka in particular, is a disaster. Mm. I think we really haven't been, yeah, we haven't uh, as a nation put in place uh, waste management policies that can ensure to say that the cities and the communities that we live in are clean. I'll give you a typical example of uh, of of my word. Okay, it's got about um, hundred thousand. I mean, hundred a population of hundred thousand. Maybe you can say seventy thousand households or so. Out of these seventy thousand households, less than ten percent subscribe to a waste management company. And you know that waste management is a business and it costs money. There are trucks that have to be hired. These trucks use fuel. You have a, a, a dump site, which is only one dump site which we have in Saka, which is Chunga dump site. There's serious congestion and there's serious chaos there. The dump site itself is a sorry site and it's another story for another day because it has outlived its usefulness. Then you have to pay workers that, uh, that work for these waste, uh, the, the waste, waste management companies. Then you have to pay the drivers. So it's a cost on itself. But if the cost ownership is not taken up by members of the community and companies within the areas where we stay, the city council itself, and I would like to be very frank about this, does not have the capacity to uh, carry out waste management on behalf of the communities. 
The city council is very constrained in terms of resources. We have a bill, a wage bill, unpaid wage bill of over one million, which has to be cleared. And then we have recurrent expenditures where we have to look at all sorts of um, service delivery issues, water, electricity, and sanitation. So the stakeholders in this issue of waste management are not only the council, but it is also us, the community. We have a role to play. But taking you back to the issue of where I was forced to dump uh, refuse at the civic center, it came about because um, the, the department in the city council that deals with the, the enforcement of uh, provisions, which should say that these, some of these um, waste management companies, by the way, waste management companies are contracted or given license by the council. They are what we call community-based uh, enterprises. These are the smaller scale the businesses that are in waste management. Then you have to what we call franchise contractors. These are the bigger guys that have compactor trucks. Uh, this is a state of, state of the art modern, uh, uh, modern uh, garbage collection vehicles, which are able to compact um, waste and then dump it like that. So these are two sets. So council itself has to enforce the collection of waste management. And in this particular case in Kamwala, they were not enforcing it. There was a contractor uh, that was um, a contracted uh, uh, to given the zone for them to collect waste management, but they didn't do it over two, week, two, two weeks. And the dumping site in the market, Obama market, which is in the central business district, who, uh, was uh, now running the risk of uh, outbreak of uh, diseases. It uh, was during the rain season, cholera was just around the corner. So I felt something really had to be done to communicate to council management. And by the way, there's people who say, but you are a councillor. Well, how did you go and dump the waste at your own council? You see, as councillors, we are, we are policy makers in the council. We are not uh, pol policy implementers. Management, the council itself, are the implementers. So if the implementers are sleeping on duty, or if they are not carrying out enforcement to remind these waste management companies to do their job, then uh, it re is really difficult for a councillor to work. And that's why I had to send a very strong message to the council by taking those sacks of waste and putting them right there at Civic Center. And believe you me, it didn't even take 30 minutes after I dumped that waste there. They responded effectively. And I think ever since they have been on time where there are challenges, they do call me and say, okay, we have a broken down track. We might delay for a, a day or two to collect the waste. And uh, I think it has improved in the way uh, waste management in this, in this city is managed. But by and large, I think we are yet to bring more people on board in terms of ensuring, say, that uh, companies, individual households subscribe to waste management companies so that at the end of the day, these waste management can, uh, companies can meet the cost of managing waste, which the council cannot. Okay. So I'm now interested to go further and say, do you then think that the type of leadership that Zambia needs at the moment should be radical? like your approach? Well, not only a, a radical approach in Zambia, I think Africa by and large needs a radical ap approach to leadership. And what I mean by radical doesn't mean uh, being violent, doesn't mean being a nuisance, doesn't mean being in people's faces. It's just about uh, being aggressive in the way we approach uh, issues such as uh, a lack of performance by some people in offices who are there to work, but they're not, they not working. I think we must uh, do away with a, a what we call protocol, you know, the bureaucracy. Before you can before you can buy a pen, this pen first, is the committee has to sit and assess, okay, how many pens do we need? Before the committee, after the committee sits, it goes to management, management discusses it. After management discusses it, they throw it back to the committee and wait for the next full council. Just to procure a pen, it will take you about six months. Now, such kind of bureaucracy slows down service delivery. And I think a radical approach to that would be like, put aside the bureaucracy, this item is needed, let's make the process for procurement or the process to, be, to, to allow things to be done quicker than they, they, than they are being done. Because by and large, I think uh, we have situations uh, or bureaucratic processes and procedures we slow down development. I'll give you another example. There's a particular NGO in my world, it's called Green Spaces. Uh, one of the qualifications to have this uh, uh, NGO registered by the youth is that they needed a letter of recommendation from the Ministry of uh, Green Economy. How long has it been since they applied for that letter of recommendation? It's two months down the line. They haven't got just a simple letter. It takes me as a counselor only 30 minutes to issue a recommendation letter. If somebody comes to say, oh, I want to apply for, for a scholarship, maybe with this board or that uh, loan, uh, loan, 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 loan board, I simply write it in 30 minutes and I paint my signature and I give them and say, off you go, good luck, wish you all. 
But to get a recommendation letter from a ministry, they say it has to go through all sorts of processes. Now, by the time it is coming after three months, if you had donors perhaps wanted to fund your NGO, the opportunity would have been missed. And this is how we keep depriving ourselves of development because we are letting uh, uh, bureaucratic procedures that slow us down take the front while it's our needs take the back seat. So being radical is removing some of these bureaucratic processes and ensuring it so that, that as a leader, if things are not working, you take the forefront and ensure to say that things are done. Another example, which I think is radical in itself, was the President Haka in HLMA's visit to the Ministry of Health. We had been hearing of the shortage of drugs and the lack of an, a, a, an employment for, among the doctors and the nurses and health workers. And what did the president do? He didn't sit back at State House and watch on TV to get updated on the crisis that was ensuing. What he did is he paid a spot visit to the Ministry of Health and worked there that day. He said, I think that is as radical as any, any leader can be. You go to the spot and say, I won't let the bureaucrats tell me they are working on it. I'll go and sit with them and find out exactly what is going on. And if there are any issues that or encumbrances that need to be sorted out, let them be sorted out. The following day, the advert for the health workers came out. The procurement process for the drugs, uh, as we are speaking, we are told uh, very soon uh, hospitals will be restocked with the drugs. So I think uh, the radical approach to leadership is leaders taking the front seat of leadership. Because as we say, if uh, leaders ignore a problem, the problem becomes the leader and the leader becomes the problem. All right. Um, now, my um, follow-up question would be that your radical approach has sort of put you in a bit of a pickle and you're in a bit of a, a legal battle with uh, acting PF president, uh, Mr. Luvinda. And I don't want us to yes. go into the details, but what did you do that got you his attention that he's now sued you and you're now in court? battling it out <laughs> i hear he's demanding something right. like is it one million yes yes so i think uh, for me i'm there as a servant of the people and uh just when I came into office as Councillor of Kamala at five, there was a number of issues that was presented before me. And one of those issues which was presented for, before me was a, pay, a play park in question. This play park was designated to be a play park for the community, and that makes it community property. And as we know, community property or public property in the city of Lusaka, and I think anywhere else in Zambia, is under the custodianship of the local authority. So what I did find out was that uh, the procedure under which uh, that particular piece of property was gotten was not the correct procedure. And I challenged uh, uh, Honorable Gibbon Luwinda's ownership of that piece of property. And I availed several documents uh, to back up my case. And of course, he didn't sit too well with him and decided to go the legal way. And that is where we are. And of course, uh, from time to time as leaders, we we'll find ourselves in these courts, not because we are notorious, not because we are radical, but because there are people who oppose the right thing to be done for the community. All right. So do you think that a, a radical approach is sustainable? Is it something that people are going to take on or are they going to get a little ticked off? Because one of the things that happens very common in Zambia, I'll be very blunt, is that if you're a bit radical, what happens is people get a little ticked off, they're a little irritated. I beg your pardon, I think I had a bit of a, of a network problem there. Yes, I think I lost you for a few seconds there. Just come yeah. again, I didn't hear the question. All right. So I was saying, is this a, an approach that is sustainable in the long run? Can we say that radicalism and pushing things in that state is sustainable? Because like I was saying, it gets a little irritating. There are certain people who are radical and you're like, you know, and, and a lot of us are actually told to keep quiet. I'm sure you've been told to keep quiet or to watch your, 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 your actions now. So this is where I'm asking, is this something that is sustainable in the long run? Well, I can't say whether it is sustainable or not, but I, what I can say is that uh, radicalism sometimes is a, a necessary measure. And uh, I'll give you a, a, a perfect example of uh, radicalism. Remember during our time as, uh, in, in opposition as UPND, um, we were never really a violent party. We were a party that uh, usually campaigned along the ideas of peace and harmony and uh, putting forward the idea that we want for this country. But that was not sustainable because uh, 
our colleagues in the ruling party and the people Jockey Fund believed in using violence. So what actually now happened to the UPND is we had to become radical. We had to organize uh, uh, our own uh, supporters to be a little bit militant because everywhere we went, we were hounded, we were harassed by police, we were tear gassed, you know, there were rubber bullets and live bullets uh, fired at us. We never wished to be that radical. We never wished to be that confrontation. But our confrontation and our radicalism in terms of organizing and campaigning was in reaction to the current status quo of violence that was being imposed on us. So in a word, I think uh, radicalism is not just, doesn't just come about anyhow. It's a reaction to some, an obstacle or a situation which demands that the normal way of doing things is not working and therefore another way, an alternative way should be found to make uh, uh, things work. But naturally, you and me know, Zambians are not really a, a, a radical people. We are pacifists, uh, you know, we are a Christian nation. We would rather pray for a situation to resolve itself yeah. than confront people. Yeah. Uh, we are different from South Africans. South, mm -hmm. South Africans, from the way go, have always been a militant people. Their style of politics is militant. It's a culture that is accepted in, 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 in South Africa. But in Zambia, the culture is a bit pacifist. We'll say, well, even if we are not happy with the current government, let us just wait for election day and then we'll vote them out. And I, I, I know we are very, very good at keeping quiet and then showing up uh, on election day to really put forward our, 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 our being disgruntled, you know, our reservations and our happiness. But uh, I think in the interim between elections, we also need approaches that are a little bit uh, radical, a little bit unusual to solve situations which cannot be solved by doing business as usual. Um, what do you um, advise our youth today? I'm looking at the empowerment scheme that has been established for youth. And I'm a little skeptical. I, I think that, you know, empowerment is very selective. It's not going to cater for everyone. Um, I look forward to probably better systems that are going to uh, afford or accord all youth the same, um, I, you know, um, ideas. But what advice would you give to uh, youth who wants to get into politics? All right. The first thing, the first advice I would give to youth that want to get into politics is, number one, you must be, you must know what you want in politics. You must be somebody who is uh, moved with indigna indignation whenever you, you, you see injustice. You must have uh, a passion for your country. Because if you, no, no, if you don't go into politics to save, and you go into politics to save yourself, you are, you, are going to, you are going to fail in that particular field. field. Politics is a calling. It's not a calling to, uh, to self-aggrandizement. It's not a calling to self-enrichment. It's a, a, a calling to service. And sometimes it even calls for you to make uh, necessary sacrifices for you to be able to, to save your people. And of course, you know the background where we're coming from as uh, the UPND. A lot of people lose jobs. A lot of people had to support the party in hiding in the background. There wasn't any free atmosphere. So sometimes sacrifices such as those have to be made. And uh, uh, if you do not have the passion for your country, you'll be easily defeated or you'll be easily discouraged. You'll feel to say, well, this, this isn't for me. But ultimately, uh, if you have the passion, if you are a person that knows to say that you have something, a role to play to this country, if you have ideas that you need to put forward, you have to go for it. We need more youth in the politics, uh, more, now more than ever, because at the end of the day, we are the majority in this country, and we are the ones that feel the poverty, we feel the lack of opportunity. You've talked about empowerment. Who's suffering the most from the lack of empowerment? It is us, the youths. So it, if we can't step up, we should not expect people that are in their in the in the evenings or afternoons of their lives to do things for 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 us because there is no impotence for them they have played their parts they have made their money they are comfortable there is no need for them to push but there's every reason for us to push because 20 30 40 years from now we'll be here and we'll be living with the consequences either of our action or our inaction i think we should move away from this spirit of saying time itself will resolve all issues because if we do not play an active role, time itself becomes an ally of the dark uh, forces of society that are not interested in change. Yeah. So do you think that empowerment is the route for the youth? 
Is it something that it's not, just, uh, it's not just empowerment alone? It's not just empowerment alone. We must also look at a, a holistic approach uh, to to resolving the challenges of youth. Basically, youth just want jobs. They want empowerment in terms of business because they have to make a livelihood. And uh, the approach of uh, the approach of uh, a, a, a jobs isn't really that sustainable because of how long will it take for us to create jobs? We are talking about a restoring an economy that was literally on its knees. So before other metrics can come in to resolve issues, I think the quickest way to help youths is for empowerment. But even empowerment has got a limitation in terms of the resource envelope because the resource envelope that is even being given to the constituencies is not enough to give everyone empowerment. Some people will be given empowerment, others will have to wait for the next uh, disbursement, others will have to wait for other opportunities that will come from the government. But basically, like the president has been saying, it's about fixing the economy. When you fix the economy, when the fundamentals of the economy, such as production, begin to work, uh, the tax base grows, uh, mm -hmm. the, 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 the rules of business are flexed in order to allow young people with less capital to enter certain markets and certain fields of manufacturing, uh, slowly but surely, things will begin to work themselves out and you have empowerment not coming from the from a, a CDF fund, but empowerment coming from a friendly economy that allows everybody who's willing to apply themselves to whatever trade or job to thrive. All right. Uh, Mr. Mainda Simata, thank you so much. Uh, any last remarks? Do you have any last remarks that you would like to share with probably the listeners and the viewers? Yes, indeed, I do have um, um, something to say. I think in closing, I would like to urge uh, our fellow Zambians to be patient with the current uh, UPND government. I know it's not everything that can be done according to your liking in the first six months. I know there are many uh, places where I think we are lacking, where we are not moving as fast as uh, you would want us to move. But I think we are trying to find our feet. We got into a, we, 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 we took on a government that was uh, literally destroyed in terms of system. There was all sorts of uh, uh, misappropriation and uh, dysfunctionality in many systems. We are trying to put systems together. We are trying to put things together so that we can see how best we can uh, uh, move the economy forward and uh, help people to be able to make a living, to reduce the, uh, uh, the cost of living. We are not happy that uh, the, the price of fuel has to go up. We are not happy that the cost of living has to go up. We can't deny that those things are happening. All that we can ask is the, the, for the people to understand that we are doing our level best, the president is doing his level best, the MPs and the councillors are doing their level best under very strenuous circumstances to be able to get us back on track so that we can put things together and make sure to say that the Zambian economy becomes an economy where not only the rich or those that are the smartest can survive, but even more people of lower education or of no education at all, but I've got one or two skills they can use, can also survive and also benefit. So I think the current New Dawn government is doing everything that is possible to uh, to ensure to say that uh, youths in particular become uh, uh, beneficiaries of the CDF, they can become beneficiaries of several policies such as free education. And also we are trying to move uh, towards uh, a affordable quality healthcare for all universal healthcare we are trying to move towards a, a business environment where not only foreigners dominate, but even locals can partner with foreign, foreigners to be able to make uh, something for themselves. We also appreciate your criticism. Please, this is not a government that will jail you for criticizing it. This is a government that will listen to you whenever you have the criticism. So we invite a positive criticism because through the criticism, we learn of our shortcomings. And when we learn of our shortcomings, we don't give excuses. We move to ensure to say that those shortcomings are alleviated and we move in a direction where the people uh, themselves who appointed us to be able to lead, to make their lives better, can also be beneficiaries of the national cake. Thank you so much. Um, I think that has been excellently put. And thank you so much. I'm sure we'll get back to you. Um, in the course of your of your of your tenure and wishing you all the best in your political career it's interesting to watch you i think for me especially that i've watched you from way back and then it's a bit of a, a full circle kind of arrangement and i'm excited to see what more you'll be doing in your word um, th so thank you so much for um according us your time and thank you to our viewers we thank you so much and until next time um goodbye and good night thank you very much i really appreciate good night
Thank you.